Greetings from the Grover Beach Church of Christ, located at 202 South 8th Street in Grover Beach, California, located on the beautiful Central Coast. I'm Rob Redden, and I'm bringing weekly lessons from God's Holy Word. And I'm pleased you've chosen to give me some of your precious time. You know, just because a person is religious does not mean he is mentally healthy. As a matter of fact, there are countless numbers whose religious ideas or faith is a source of much mental anguish, misery, and poor mental state. You know, there have been claims made that more harm has been done in the name of religion than through any other influence in the lives of people. And I partly believe it. It does not logically follow that atheism is the solution of humanity's ills. It only suggests that the true faith may have many counterfeits that add to the miseries of the people in the world. And we need to ask ourselves, the question, is our faith healthy or a harmful faith? Does my faith promote wholesome, healthy, mental outlook? Or does it foster anxiety, fear, personality disorders in my life? Since those who are watching this believe the Bible is inspired from God and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the conviction is shared that God is not the source of the ills that harmful faith breeds in the lives of so many people. There are a couple of verses that come to mind and I'll share them with you. 3 John 1 and verse 2. The New Living Translation says, Dear friend, I'm praying that all is well with you and that your body is as healthy as I know your soul is. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes that I think is quite appropriate as well. Ecclesiastes 7.16, it may surprise you, but he says, Do not be over-righteous. Neither be overwrought wise. Why destroy yourself? And so obviously there is a distorted, deviant faith that people may have, and they may think that it is a legitimate faith before God. But let me tell you, I've collected a lot of headlines that show how harmful a bad faith is, dysfunctional faith. Parents' lead, uh, faith leads to son's death. God tells woman to kill her three children, L.A. Times. An Oregon man told people, God wants you to be rich. And they trusted him, and, and he embezzled $12 million from 200 people. A lawyer kills family to save them. Fear they were straying from their religion. He said after he shot them execution style, he knelt and said prayers for them. Boy six, set on fire. His father claimed, God told me to do it. It already stabbed his boy 10 times. Extremism is a counterfeit faith that harms. And that's why Solomon said, don't be overrighteous, neither be overwise. Why destroy yourself? You know, extremism pushes people away from God in every form, whether it's religion or otherwise. As a matter of fact, extremism blinds to the true God and true faith. 
<coughs> As a matter of fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Furthermore, a dysfunctional faith leads some to a false ideology of life. Colossians 2 and verse 8, Paul warns people about this. Christians are to be warned. See to it, he says, that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Verse 18. You know, it can even lead to compulsive addiction to an unbiblical religion. You know, the King James talks about us being a peculiar people. And in 1611, that just means unique, special. The word today, peculiar, doesn't carry that idea. And unfortunately, there are too many peculiar people claiming to be Christians, and they're obsessed with small details, and they major in minors, and these things become a source of their peace and comfort as they cross the T's and dot the I's. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, many things can become counterfeit for real spiritual growth, and acts of religion replace true steps of spiritual growth. Jesus said that in the day of judgment in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? And Jesus said, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. A dysfunctional religion finds peace in compartmentalizing one's life. These people that Jesus declared lost, regardless of how religious they were, fail to realize that true faith permeates every aspect of your life. And people often talk about, I have a religious life and I have a secular life. But when you read Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, we discovered that the transformed life, a living sacrifice, our daily life becomes our worship to God in every area and aspect of our lives. We cannot hold a corner away from God and claim to be faithful Christians. When we do that, we have a dysfunctional faith. And so, you know, faith becomes harmful when God is used to, for personal profit, a way of gain. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5, these people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they don't tell the truth. To them, religion is just a way to get rich. And you know, when you come across a man who claims to be a preacher of the gospel and he has made himself rich through the contributions of others, then obviously you can wonder why he was preaching in the first place. Now, that doesn't mean that a preacher can't be rich. I'm talking about how he became rich. If he used the religion to become rich, if that was his intention, then he falls under the condemnation of Paul here. I remember in my first uh, ministry in Sterling, Colorado, right across the street was a couple. They were middle age. She came to worship with us. She was a member of our congregation, but he never came. And I asked her, I said, what is it with your husband? Why doesn't he come with you? And she said, well, he goes to the big church at town, in town. I says, oh. 
and I discovered that he worked at a barber shop and he shined shoes. So I decided to go and get my shoes shine and have a talk with him. And he was glad to see me and he was a very friendly, cordial guy and I appreciate uh, him being open with me. And I asked him, I says, hey, you're, you're, you just live across the street and, you're, and your wife comes to church. Why don't you come to church with her? And he says, well, you know, I go to the big church. I says, well, why do you go there? He says, because I shine more shoes because I go to that big church. Well, at least he was honest, but he also betrayed a dysfunctional faith, a faith that is used for profit. You know, faith is harmful when it's used to control the freedom of others, too. How often have you seen parents manipulate their children through faith, shaming them because they're not obeying all the little details of what they believe? In Galatians 2, 4, we find that NIV reads, This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus to make us slaves. If we're slaves to ritual, if we're slaves to details that are matters of opinion, when opinion is made law, and we use that to teach and control others, we fall under the condemnation here at Galatians 2 and verse 4. Our faith has become harmful. Our faith is dysfunctional. Furthermore, people have used religion as a pretext for one's selfish pleasure, and that's very harmful and it's dysfunctional. In Galatians 5 and verse 3, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You see, if somebody says, well, we're saved by grace and not works, so my works doesn't matter because grace is going to save me anyway. One young man told me that, that because Jesus died for him, then it solved all the future sins that he might commit, that they're already forgiven before he even commits it. That, my friends, is a dysfunctional faith based upon misinformation and wishful thinking. And furthermore, it oppresses or harms others. The Pharisees were very religious people. They wore garb to distinguish them from others. People knew who they were and that they were the elite religious people of the day. But Jesus said, Luke 18, verse 9, to some who were very confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told the parable of the rich man and the tax collector going up to the temple to pray. Now, this word looked down on is better rendered held others in contempt. And obviously they did because they criticized Jesus for trying to help sinners to find the way of God. On the other hand, healthy faith is a perfect life. It's a life of wholeness. In Luke 2, 52, we read, And Jesus as a child, grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and men. And that is a paradigm, a pattern, an example for you and me. Jesus matured in stature. Physical development is important, and we should obviously uh, take care of our health because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. And 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Paul says, Exercise profits some, but godliness is profitable for all things. Paul is not dismissing the value of exercise, but of course that day they didn't have to pay to sweat because they didn't have all the amenities that we do today. But we do need to concern, be concerned about our bodies. And then he grew in wisdom. Mental development. And that, of course, requires being around people who are wise and wise in the right things 
and to be able to absorb the wisdom of others, as children often do. And then there is that social development in favor with men. A child must live in a community. And we find Jesus living in the community of Nazareth. And he obviously worshipped in the synagogue there. And he attended the Jewish feasts. All this resulted in a mix with other people, a community, and developing uh, social skills, uh, interaction that is uh, important for maturation. And we too need the church because we can make friends with people that may be a little different from us. In the world, we may not have chosen these people to be our friends. And that's unfortunate. But in the church, we can become friends with people who have so much to offer us because we are enmeshed with them in a, a, a very profitable way. And we develop a closeness and a friendship and an understanding that develops tolerance and understanding and patience and the qualities that come with social development. But also there is that spiritual development in favor with God. He had a devout family, his mother and his, and his stepfather. There was a spiritual home and a religious atmosphere in the synagogue where he developed spiritually through the listening and the teaching of God's word. So healthy faith means that there is a balanced life. Extreme extremists suffer in relationships and jobs and influence and also the struggle of finding peace. Religious fanatics will do everything in the world to make converts. And they, just like Jesus described the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 15, make their converts twice as much a son of hell as themselves. But a healthy faith is is wholeness. You know, hypocrisy is a sick faith. It makes people guilt-ridden and calloused. They hold other people with contempt even though they do the same things that they do, as Paul mentions in Romans chapter 2. But being true to self and to others, and especially to God, is the first step toward a wholeness and mental healthy life. You remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The wholeness includes our whole person, body, soul, and spirit. A healthy faith is a faith balanced with good works. James 2 and verse 19 says, even the demons believe and tremble. So the most religious beings in the universe are obviously the devil and his demons. And so being religious is not the same thing as having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with our God in heaven and enjoying the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, a faith-only religion is an anxious religion because a person is always wondering whether or not their faith is adequate or that faith only can so convince them that they're saved and can't be lost because they have, a fa uh, have faith, but that faith is not a healthy faith because otherwise they would be actively involved in church activities and good works and trying to lead other people to Christ. Faith in action is a fulfilling faith and a faith that leads to peace of mind. A faith that is wholesome and healthy doesn't need all the answers to our questions. That ultimately we believe in God and we must believe and trust with all our heart, soul, and mind 
that God will ultimately do what is right. A healthy faith seeks to promote the good of others through love. And a healthy faith seeks to control one's own life and not the lives of others. Now, Galatians 5, 6, that we discover that as we have opportunity, 610, pardon me, we do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. In Galatians 5, 6, he says that circumcision and uncircumcision, whether you're Jew or Gentile, is irrelevant. Irre but what matters most is faith working through love. We need to trust God's will over our wisdom. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. That means that there are things that we will not learn or understand in this lifetime. We are flesh. God is the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who is not only just, he is holy. And his purpose and his plan is to redeem mankind through Jesus Christ and take us to heaven. You know, we need to look upon life as an adventure rather than a curse. Abraham, when he was called to leave his homeland to a place that God would show him, took that adventure without knowing his destination, but he knew who was leading him. Hebrews 11, verse 8. We need to obey God because we love him, not because we fear him. This is the love of God that we uh, obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. We need to focus on the Lord instead of ourselves. And we sing that song in the last stanza, none of self, but all of thee. And we need to grow and mature with time. When Little faith becomes great faith. In the Gospels, little faith is used more often of Jesus' disciples than others. I know of at least almost a half a dozen times where he refers to little faith, whereas great faith is used only twice and of a Gentile man and a Gentile woman, Matthew 8:10. Matthew 15, 28. No wonder the apostles asked the Lord in Luke 17, 5, Lord, increase our faith. Have you asked the Lord in prayer lately to increase your faith? You know, we need to sense our worth to God. You know, he is concerned about the birds of heaven. But he says, are not you more important than they? And we need to trust in God. Jesus asked us to do that. You believe in God? Believe also in me. John 14, verse 1. We need to embrace our emotions as a part of our humanity. Because we're made in the image of God. And we need to desire to be made holy, sanctified for the Master's use. Hebrews 12 and verse 14 states clearly, without sanctification, no one will see God. So ultimately, if seeing God is dependent upon us perfecting holiness, we certainly would pursue it. And furthermore, love is the greatest gift of all because it seeks to please the object of our love. And the greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And truly, if we reciprocate the love of God, we will aspire to be like his son, Jesus. In Luke 8, in verse 25, Jesus asked his disciples, Where is your faith? You know, he asked the same question today of us. Where is your faith? Will the Lord say that we have a great faith today or soon? Can it be said, as it was said of Stephen and Barnabas, who were full of faith, Acts 6, 8, and Acts eleven twenty four? Does the Lord look down upon us as rich in faith, James 2 and verse 5? 
Does he see us with sincere faith? 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. Is our faith a healthy faith, a sound faith? You know, a healthy faith asserts reality. It doesn't deny it. The primary belief about reality is that God exists and that the Bible is the revelation of his will for our lives. Another fact about reality is that God's will is not weird, it's not grotesque, and it's not bizarre. The Christian seeks to influence society as yeast influences flour. If he imbibes the spirit of Christ, he will attract people like flowers attract bees because they will see the wholeness, the wholesomeness, and the goodness radiating from our lives. You know, often a Christian must, must take a stand that's unpopular because it's the will of God and suffer persecution. But others will see our conviction and be moved by that. And the failure of a Christian to take a stand is a sign of an unhealthy faith. Fear of persecution or other people's opinions about us do not mesh with a healthy faith. A healthy faith will discover God's will and follow it regardless of the consequences. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, may we seek your will and discover a path of maturity and faith that will draw people to you through our wholeness. Help us, dear Lord, not to be caught up in the fads or popular psychology to fix our condition created by a flawed faith or a misunderstanding of true faith. Make us whole, Father, in body and spirit and soul, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for your interest in these videos. Share them with your friends and your neighbors and your loved ones. They are available at our website, GroverBeachChurchOfChrist.com or on YouTube. So until next week, exercise your faith, deepen your faith, seek a wholesome faith, and worship with your church family on the Lord's Day for direction, guidance, and encouragement. May God bless you, is my prayer. Goodbye.